Hey guys, Sir Owen Disney here. It is Wednesday, and of course that means it's time to talk TNA Impact. Before I get started, got a lot going on right now. I can't say this is housekeeping, but I guess you can somewhat say it is because I'm going to drop a couple bits of knowledge on you guys. Number one, I got 133 days. I'm back in Orlando again. Number two, it's going to officially be announced today by Universal, finally, that King Kong is coming back to the resort and is going to be in that huge colossal show building in Islands of Adventure. That being said... So much going on. I'm going to be staying at the Hard Rock Hotel for a night, and this is just going to be a colossal trip, and obviously we'll be talking about it in the very near future. But before I get started with Impact from this past week, I want to drop a little bit of information as well. First off, we all know that Jeff Hardy suffered a broken tibia in a dirt biking accident, and he got checked out, and we found out that he's going to probably be returning to action within the next couple of months. So two months is his projected return to TNA Impact. So hopefully uh, more rumors about the Hardys being stripped of the TNA World Tag Team Championships will not happen because with both companies right now, you have people that are injured, can't defend their championships, and they're unable to do anything but strip them, even though they basically just did this before. Both companies are suffering this issue right now. So hopefully... Neither one ends up permanent, and uh, obviously Jeff will be returning soon. Dana Bryan, on the other hand, uh, fingers are crossed. Hopefully things are better for him. So other news, obviously, TNA returns live. That's right, live from Soundstage 20 at Universal Studios, Florida, and it's going to be this Friday. So yes, you're actually getting this video on Wednesday. Two days later... We're going to do something we haven't done in a long time. Yes, that's right. Ashley and myself are going to be doing a live TNA popcast that's going to be done right after the live impact. Ashley said for live impacts, we do these popcasts. So that's going to be coming your way 11 p.m. on Friday night. And if we get started a little bit later, then my apologies, but uh, it won't be any longer than like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, obviously. If we're not there at 11 o'clock, hang in there, we'll be there very soon after. So, this is yet another free purview that I like to call them. This is Hardcore Justice, and they're actually doing a pay-per-view. It was officially announced this past week that Slammiversary is also going to be held at Universal Studios, and it's also going to be part of another TNA taping week, which is going to include, well, there's, there's a day in between. It's funny, though, which is weird when you look at this. The live impact is going to be taped on the 26th, and then the 28th is going to be Slammiversary. This is of June, by the way. The 29th, the 30th, and July 1st are all going to be TNA tapings of sorts, whether they're doing one-night onlys or whether it's going to be impact tapings for the next couple of weeks. This schedule makes me think that there's probably no way I'm going to get to see TNA live this year, but stranger things have happened. Hopefully that'll work out some sooner rather than later. So let's start off Hardcore Justice with a six-man tag team street fight. It's the Hardys teaming up with Davey Richards, taking on the Revolution members, Koya, Abyss, and Manic. Uh, I'm going to start a new way of doing uh, recaps here. I usually go midway through the match. Now I'm going to just go to the finish, but if there's anything awesome that happens in between, I'm going to uh, talk about it. So that's how we're going to do it. So Davey Richards has a hanging vertical suplex and a great tribute to the late Davey Boy Smith in a 40-second vertical to Manic. Davey holds a chair in front of Abyss's face later on in the match, and Matt is down on all fours. Obviously, they usually set up for poetry in motion, but this time, no, Jeff springs off and drop kicks the chair into Abyss's face. Jeff and Matt both take turns beating Koya mercifully with a garbage can. And we get a nice Tower of Doom spot, which is completely convoluted, but it's it's a multi-man match. You're going to have that. Manic superplexes Davey Richards, while the Hardys with a double-team side camera leg sweep on Manic. This allows Abyss and Koya to hit a power bomb on both Hardys, and obviously they all connect at once. Abyss goes for the choke slam. Davey floats over and completely does a flip, backflips out of it. Ducks the right hand, drop kick to the knee, nails the round kick. Koya charges. He gets low bridged over the top to the floor. Davey hits the tope suicida and Jeff with a pescado onto Koya. 
Matt charges into Manic. He gets both boots up in the air. Middle rope is caught with a side effect. And Davey heads up top for the Invader double foot stomp. And Abyss makes the save. He choke slams Davey Richards. Jeff with a boot, whip in reverse, and Abyss catches him with a back elbow, grabs a chair, puts it on Jeff, goes for the, earth, the earthquake splash, and of course, Jeff turns it on its side, and Abyss crotches himself. Matt with a boot, a twist of fate, Jeff rips off the shirt, nails the swanton bomb, one, two, three, and the Hardys and Davey Richards win the opening matchup for Hardcore Justice. After it's all said and done, James Storm comes out and browbeats Abyss, basically says, you failed me one too many times, I'll deal with you later. And all three Hardys and, well, both Hardys and uh, Davey Richards, they howl, and that's how we end this. Um, I like this. It was a good good street fight to open off the show. Obviously, we're playing up the uh, Hardys versus the Revolution storyline. And the fact that Abyss can't get the job done. So, who knows if he's going to turn... He's going to turn face again. I, I, I don't know at this point. It could go either way. Obviously, it would make sense for everyone to turn on James Storm in the end. And James Storm, being the only one left standing, has to fight the members of his revolution one by one. Kind of like when the flock turned on Raven and WCW. Kind of like that. Something like that. In that way, I think that he keeps Koya, and that's it, because they really need to do something with Koya, because like I said, he's got a sweet Rydeen Bomb, but the only thing he's got going for him is he's got the Rydeen Bomb, and he looks like Trick Nasty, and only about five of you out there will get that reference, and those five are probably not watching this video. But still, I will state right now the fact that Koya is very um, underutilized for a reason. He's uh, green as grass. Green is my iPhone right now. So yeah, and, and you see my iPhone on video, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see my iPhone, and if you're watching NXT when Tyler Breeze made his debut, he brought it out to ringside to take selfies with it. And if you watch the E60 uh, behind the curtain, which unfortunately I did not get a chance to check out yet, hopefully that will be uh, watched sometime this week, he was bringing out that phone. So yeah, green is my iPhone cover. So he's got to be protected, tag matches, multi-man matches, basically where he's not the only person competing. That being said, James Storm will probably take him under his wing, and that will be the end of that, and he'll fight with the Revolution one by one. Manic may stick around. He fits really well as a heel. Um, I, I like Manic, actually, a lot more now, so. We continue. <clears throat> we get our new official announcement of our new commentator for Impact, and that is Al Snow, someone that I've liked for a long time. Obviously, I'm a, I was a big fan of Al Snow and the Job Squad, and... Um, his brother, Logan Kane, worked on the first ever indie show that I was a part of. I set up chairs, but still, I was a part of the show. I was a part of the setup of the show. I was not part of actually calling the show, working the show. I helped set up the ring and set up the chairs, and that's what you do when you pay your dues in this business. That's pretty much what it works. I also know we're in this sweet brown smoking jacket, and uh, basically, uh, Josh Matthews giving him some uh, some flack for it. Mr. Anderson is in the back. He's dressed like he's ready to sell you a Kirby vacuum cleaner. Yes, he is. He has a sign of his own backstage, and he basically says, I'm not going to reveal this, and that's pretty much it. So Anderson comes out to the ring in order to actually reveal his sign, and he mocks Ethan Carter III for being boring last week. Carter comes out with Tyrus, and he says, I cannot be copied. My campaign is no joke, and it's very real. Anderson knows that Carter wants the championship, and he needs to win it for himself, but simply put, I wrote Carter is a bastard, spelled with an E, not an A. Why? Because he wants his scalps, the scalps of the Hall of Fame superstars that he's left in his wake, and the fact that the undefeated streak is the very most important thing to Ethan Carter III at this point. Anderson reveals a sign that says, Mr. Anderson beat the streak. Yeah. I'm sure anybody that's not watching TNA right now that saw this probably was thinking, uh, he can't do that, he's in another company, and someone already beat the streak. No, no, completely different. No, companies are different. No matter what people think, companies are different. So, Anderson makes a challenge for Impact. It's later announced that the fan, well, actually, it's announced right there, but the fans are going to get to vote for the stipulation. It's going to be an arm wrestling challenge, or it's going to be a Falls Count Anywhere match. And if I was EC3, I would have a lot of trepidation about going into both. Because, number one, if you lose a Falls Count Anywhere match, obviously there's no harm in losing a wrestling match to someone. But can you imagine 
they're not going this way, obviously. But can you imagine if the colossal undefeated streak of Ethan Carter III came to an end at the hands of an arm wrestling match on a live impact? Yeah, that something's not stirring the Kool-Aid with that. So yeah, we're probably going to get a Falls Can Anywhere match. I'm guaranteeing we do this Friday on Impact, and we'll talk about it at 11 p.m. Uh, cheap plug one more time. So I-, I like this. I like this a lot. Anderson basically is told to tread lightly, so... Uh, Carter only accepts the challenge to pacify him, and he's like, you know what, if I get you to shut up, fine, I'll accept your challenge. So it's official. Ethan Carter III and Mr. Anderson this Friday on Impact. Fans choose either Falls Cut Anywhere, which is Anderson's stipulation, or Carter's stipulation, which, of course, is an arm wrestling match. I like the feud between Anderson and EC3. It's only going to further elevate Carter and his eventual actual reign as TNA World Heavyweight Champion, which he should be sooner rather than later. Up next, we have a four-way for the X Division Championship. It is the Battle of the Reality Shows, yes. In a ladder match, you have the current TNA X Division Champion, Rockstar Spud, which was a winner of British Boot Camp. We have Mark Mandrews Andrews, yeah, say that five times fast, who was also a winner on TNA British Boot Camp. You have Tigre Uno, who was a part of TNA Gut Check. And you have, representing the Beatdown Clan, Kenny King, who was a member of... Tough enough, say yes. The battle of the reality shows in a completely different way. This match was off the hook as always when it comes to X Division matches. Mandrews has a standing shooting star... Standing. He has a shooting star press off the top rope to both King and Uno, which are fighting on the floor. Mandrews climbs the ladder. Uno catches him and nails the Spanish fly, which we have not seen in quite a long time, off the ladder. So kudos to the Spanish announce team there. Haven't seen... Any SAT moves in a while. I know uh, Kazarian uses it when he uh, calls it the flux capacitor. And given the fact it's 2015, it makes perfect sense to call it the flux capacitor. But still, Spud stops Kenny King from climbing. And he knocks him off the ladder momentarily. Spud runs back up the trade punches. And snap jab, ducks the right hand. Kenny King gets nailed with a Pele kick. Spud climbs up. King climbs up. King with a kick to the ribs. The, uh... The bullseye, the DDP bullseye, obviously, which, of course, is the the taped ribs. Uno springs up to the ladder, and King tosses him off. He's basically playing King of the Mountain, playing keep away with everyone else in the match. So Spud finally climbs up. His tie's off, obviously. That means it's time to get serious. And he punches, and he bites Kenny King. He knocks him off. Rockstar Spud climbs up again. Homicide pulls Spud off, and he lands hard onto the ladder, which is set up uh, diagonally in the corner. King climbs up, grabs the championship, and retains, celebrating with Homicide. Um, this was fine. Putting the title back on a member of the Beatdown Clan. I got no issues with this. You're not necessarily going to give the world title to MVP anytime soon. I There are reasons you could put the tag team titles on maybe... Um, at this point, since Kenny King's got a title, it'll be Homicide and Low Key. So the Rottweilers uh, with the TNA World Tag Team Championships. I got zero issues with that. And uh, MVP, of course... He'll get pushed towards the world title, but right now it's the feud with the Rising. And I like the way this was set up. Spud shows a lot of spunk afterwards, talking about the storied history of the X Division Championship and names like Jerry Lynn and Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, and basically talking about the fact that he's going to prove why he belongs in that upper echelon with them, and he's going to get his championship back. That's later on in the uh, the segment. The Beatdown Clan are celebrating um, low key, the, the victory of Kenny King. MVP says uh, the, um, the rumors of our demise have greatly been exaggerated. They hold their future in their own hands, and tonight Loki will end this once and for all with Drew Galloway in the uh, Pipe on a Pole match. So Eric Young comes out with a stretcher, and of course he says he's a world-class professional wrestler, he's a world-class man, he's a world-class champion, but anyone standing in his way has went out on a stretcher. He named drops Austin Aries and Bobby Lashley and even even Bobby Roode, obviously. He says Kurt Angle is basically a beaten man and he's been proven now that he can be beaten. He is very vulnerable at this point. He can't duck Eric Young anymore and in a stretcher match, it may be non-title, but still the damage will be done. Tonight, he's going to do what legends and icons couldn't do, and that's end the career of Kurt Angle. I I really like this promo a lot. Eric Young is a very untested commodity 
in wrestling, period. And I'm very glad to see they're finally utilizing him to the fullest of his capacity. Anybody that don't know anything about Eric Young's career outside of TNA, his run now is fine. His world title run was fine. But knowing stuff like Team Canada and the Don't Fire Eric stuff and being, like, the greatest babyface in TNA history. But that's one thing. But Eric Young, when he's serious, he can definitely go. And, I mean, that's the reason why he got the win over uh, the band. Yeah, when he beat when he beat Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. That's the reason why. When he hit that flying elbow off the top of the cage, that was proof positive that Eric Young is someone not to be messed with. And this feud is further proving that. And once again will lead to Eric Young once more becoming TNA World Heavyweight Champion. And that's exactly what should happen. So as a result of what happened last week, we get a matchup with the new number one contender, Brooke, defend, defending her number one contendership against the TNA Knockouts champion, Taryn Terrell. Of course, she has Marty Bell and Jade of the Dollhouse in her corner. So let's pick it up midway through. Taryn hits the flying body press but finds nothing but canvas. Brooke with two forearms hits a third one, two clotheslines off the ropes, flying forearm, catches the back elbow, and she goes for a 10 punch, turns it into a sit-out face buster. Marty and Jade pull Tara into the floor, and in tow, Brooke climbs to the top rope and dives on all three members of the dollhouse. So tosses her in, ducks Tara and slap, and slaps the taste right out of her mouth. Brooke hits the flapjack, and she heads up top. Marty distracts Stifler as the referee, of course. Jade shoves Brooke off the top rope. Taryn connects with the TKO, the Taryn knockout, for the three count, and a very seductive pinning combination, basically uh, dropping it like it's hot, pretty much. And gets the pin. Marty and Jade hit a really awesome parachute bomb. Which you remember back in grade school. We had the big multicolored parachute. And you would do it in gym class. And I don't know if all of you did it. But I know I did. And you would basically lift the parachute up in the air. And watch it fall to the ground. Lift the parachute up in the air. Well sometimes we did this for fun. Yeah they basically did this with the body of Brooke. And I, I really like that. Because that's very interesting utilization. Considering the fact that they're kind of schoolgirls, the ring around the rosy stuff, obviously, um, I love the parachute being used to this. I think it's it works really well. So Taryn, of course, playing the Rose McGowan role yet again. She stuffs the jawbreaker in Brooke's mouth from Jade's cleavage after she uh, licks it, drops it like it's hot. Yeah, 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 it's really, really sexy. I'm not going to lie about that. But... That's what the dollhouse are basically playing up. They're playing up the fact that sex sells and also the fact that the old guard is dead and the new guard is what's going to be taking over now. Taryn says, Brooke says, nobody's going to beat me. This is our house. This is the dollhouse. Gail comes out and says, you know what? And Taryn shuts her down and says, you know what? I'm sick and tired of being in your shadow. And Gail's like, this isn't about me. This is about the entire knockouts division. We're all in this together. Yeah, it's, it's a high school musical moment. And Taryn says, you know what, now it's time to live in my shadow. There's three of us, and you're all alone. And Gail's like, no, I'm not. I'm not alone. The music hits, and Awesome Kong comes out, standing at the top of the ramp. So Kim and Kong stand united against the dollhouse. And the match has been announced for this Friday, two days from now, on the Live Impact from Universal. It is going to be the dollhouse taking on Gail Kim and Awesome Kong. Now, granted, if there were difference in situations in this world, I would love to see this be three-on-three three with the final member being ODB or being Velvet Sky, because obviously he represents the old guard of TNA. Not that's a bad thing. I'm talking about the veterans of the TNA Knockouts division. But Gail Kim and Kong standing united against the dollhouse. I really like this. I like two enemies standing against a common bond. And I think it works quite well. So I'm really curious to see where we go with this. We get our next match. It is our pipe on a pole match. It is low key against Drew Galloway. Obviously, we don't have a beatdown clan and the rising at ringside. They come out later. So in the middle of the match, the fans hold Drew hold uh, low key for Drew Galloway, and he chops him viciously across the guardrail. Drew hits a suplex on the ring apron on low key and sets up a superplex on an open chair, but low key ends up headbutting him off. Drew comes off and low key basically embisons him. I have that done to me before. It's not fun. But instead of hitting the seat of the chair, he hits the top of the chair on his ribs. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, was extremely painful. So he gets a two count off of that. He grabs the pole and it gets cut off. 
the pipe, I'm not, I meant to say. So Drew climbs up, they fight on top, they accidentally knock the pipe off, and I'm sure Botchamania, Matthew's, Matthew's watching, so yeah, there you go. <coughs> Drew gets tied up in the tree of woe, and Drew counters the warrior's way into basically an overhead throw. Drew grabs the pipe, and he goes to the middle rope. He gets caught with a round kick from Loki, which stops him dead in his tracks. Key's got the pipe. He ducks the shot. Future Shock DDT connects. Spikes him right on top of the chair. And Galloway wins this after the match is over. Beatdown Clan come out and attack. The Rising make the save. They brawl. We go to commercial. And that's the end of the segment. Obviously, we're building towards a matchup where we have multi-man stable warfare. I'm pretty sure that's what we're leading towards, and I think that's the right direction to go. I think this seems like a cage match. Seems like a war game style stipulation, but the problem is they need one more member of the beatdown clan. Wow, long day. We need one more member of the Rising because you've got you've got Loki, you've got Homicide now, you've got Kenny King, and you've got MVP, but then again, I could say Kenny King could defend the X Division Championship, and MVP, Homicide, and Loki, what a stable that is could go in against Galloway, Drake, and uh, Micah. So I think that might be what the direction we're going in. And I think that sounds like it's custom-made for Slammiversary. If they don't blow it off on Impact first, and we get Galloway and MVP at Slammiversary, which is a possibility as well. I think either direction is um, a direction that I can easily see them going into. So then, of course, we get a, uh, a segment that... I'm not going to lie, kind of hits close to home. And for those of you that know me personally, you understand exactly what I say with this. So Mickey James has her child at the grocery store, and she runs into James Storm, and James is basically there. This is being filmed like voyeur, voyeur style. So obviously the cameraman that was told by Magnus last week to watch over Mickey is filming from the shadows. Yeah, I, I don't know why he needs to film in secrecy, but uh, okay. So Mickey gives the, the kid to James Storm. And James holds her, and they go look for diapers. And he says, where's Nick? And first time I remember hearing Magnus's shoot name being mentioned on television. Oh, he's back of the room. Ah, okay, I see. Let's go to the grocery store. Nothing wrong with this. Completely innocent. Completely innocent for anybody but James Storm. Because obviously James Storm is being played off. Like Davey Richards said on Impact a couple weeks ago, he is the devil himself. And he will do anything to manipulate anyone to doing what he wants. Magnus is in the ring, and before he says anything, James Storm comes out. Magnus is pissed off, of course. He appreciates that James Storm made the save so Bram wouldn't take out Mickey once and for all, but now he's overstepping his boundaries. She's not a member of his revolution, and he needs to stop trying to drive a wedge between us. Hey, James Storm's just trying to be a good friend. You know what, Magnus, you got trust issues. You hired a cameraman to follow Mickey around. I've known Mickey for longer than you have, and you know, if it was so innocent, why didn't she tell you that she was seeing me? Watch that she saw me at the grocery store. Why don't you go ask Mickey yourself? I like the direction this is going. I do. Um, I'm kind of split on this, obviously. I think this is a really good feud, and I really think it's going to be a bloodbath between these two. I think we're leading towards a stipulation match. It's going to, I would say, if I had to guess, it's going to an I Quit match. That's what makes the most sense to me. I mean, we could do, like, a Texas Death Match or anything like that. We could possibly do that. I know we just saw an Extreme Rules. I get that. but And it makes sense, given the fact it's James Storm. But... I really think this is leading to an I Quit match. I think this is leading to a bloody, intense I Quit match that's going to lead with Mickey throwing the towel in for Magnus. Yeah, I know it's the finish I called for Extreme Rules with Lana and Rusev, but still. That's what I'm thinking we're leading towards. Slammiversary, I think we're going to have an I Quit match between Magnus and Storm. Or it's either going to be throws a towel in for Magnus, and then it's revealed that she only did it to prevent him from personally getting hurt like, permanently. Or Mickey can go heel and join James Storm in the Revolution. I think that might be a right direction to go. But it sounds like Bram might be joining the Revolution sooner rather than later. I think just as soon as maybe this week's Impact, if I had to guess. But we'll talk about that later. Kurt Angle says it's beyond personal with Eric Young now. And now he simply put, he's going to break him in half. So we get our next match. The main event, it is a stretcher match. Non-title TNA World Heavyweight Champion Olympic Gold Medalist Kurt Angle taking on Showtime Eric Young. I like to call him the loose can, the 2015 loose cannon, and um, 
I have to pick it up off the midway point here. Angle with two clotheslines, whip in. EY with a tip up, gets caught. Rolling German suplex. The third is almost stopped, but Angle's like vice like grip is still locked on. Allowing for Eric Young to rip the turnbuckle completely off the pad. The third German still connects. The fourth one is pretty much momentarily stopped when they both tumble through the ropes to the floor. But the grip is still on. And Eric Young finally stops all of this with using the hammer jammer, the shin guard back kick right to the groin. So he sets up with a pile driver. Angle double legs him. Slingshots him into the ring post. And hits the angle slam on the floor. You have to understand. The ring apron, and the guardrail are extremely close together. There's about this much between the two. I hope this is not the picture, because this is going to be really weird to explain. But still, they're this close, and he still was able to hit the angle slam, so kudos to Angle for being able to maneuver Eric Young enough to be able to hit it without hitting the guardrail or kicking a fan, and kudos to Eric Young for having the balls to take something that risky. I think it worked really well, and I think it worked great considering the fact they're both trying to kill each other in a stretcher match. So Angle puts EY on the stretcher, and he goes to strap him down. He straps down the legs, and he goes to strap down the arms, and of course he gets stopped with the thumb to the eye. Tosses him in. Young goes for the figure four, gets countered, and of course he shoves him towards the exposed buckle, but Eric Young puts on the brakes. Boot in, pile driver, but a backdrop counter out into a sunset flip. Angle rolls through, locks in the ankle lock. Ankle lock, of course, maneuvering towards, you know, exactly where this is headed. Eric Young forward roll since angle into the exposed buckle. Pile driver from Eric Young. Hits a second one. Angle's dead weight. He drags him, puts him on the stretcher, straps him in, and Eric Young wins the match. Takes the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, raises it high in the air, and drops it on the prone body of Angle. Still strapped. To the stretcher. I really enjoyed this match. I like this a lot. Um, might need a little bit of blood here, but I think that we're building to something else here. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure we've got a vicious, a vicious stipulation between these two. Maybe, like I said, James Storm. I was talking about James Storm and Magnus doing an I Quit match. This might be more of an I Quit match, but I mean, this is going to be something more brutal than that. This this could be a bunch of things at this point, but. Like an old school cage match, I think this would be great for lockdown. But I, you got to do something in this match. You got to do something with this feud. We got to end it properly. I really enjoy the chemistry between these two, and I'm really excited to see where we go from here. To be honest, this is a good addition of Impact. I really enjoyed it. I'm really looking forward to talking Impact live. First time we've done it in like year, literally years. The first time we've talked Impact in a long time. I haven't, I haven't done a live TNA recap. I haven't been able to watch live TNA on uh, Destination America on Friday night in a long time. Why? Because basically most of the Friday nights we're filming. We're filming verses. We're filming AJ's movie reviews. We don't have time. But we're filming tomorrow, and that means I don't have to do anything on Friday. And Friday night, I'm clear to watch Impact and do the podcast with Ashley. So, yeah, looking forward to that. On the show, I would say right now, the opening street fight was entertaining. It furthers the fact that eventually the Revolution are going to turn on James Storm, and they're all going to give Storm his comeuppance. I like the feud between Ethan Carter III and Mr. Anderson. It's just going to elevate him further towards his eventual world title reign. I like Al Snow on commentary. I like his color work. I think it actually works really well. I mean, he's a little bit bland, but I like Al Snow, personally. I would... I've not said that he's bland. I would say that other people would, but I like Al Snow in commentary. It's fine. The four-way X Division ladder match that was fine. Kenny King winning the title with Homicide's help. Obviously, that means Spud's going to want Homicide now. I'm sure that may happen. They could book that potentially for Friday night. I think that's the direction I would go. Maybe it's like you want a shot at Kenny King. you got to go through Homicide. I could see that being an option at this point. I love the feud between Eric Young and Kurt Angle. I think it works really well. The beatdown clan and the rising kind of put on the back burner a little bit, but it's still there, and I think it works. Gail Kim and Awesome Kong having to coincide in order to take down the dollhouse and to topple Taryn Terrell's tyrannical tyranny. Yes! I said it without screwing it up. Yes, I think it's got gold written all over it. I really enjoyed... Key and Galloway was fine. Um, not enough, no blood here. I think there probably should have been blood in this match, honestly, if anything. I, I really like what they're doing with James Storm and uh, Magnus. I, I think it's entertaining. I, I have my reasons. 
and uh, Kurt Angle and Eric Young. Great main event, great stretcher match, great way to, to end Hardcore Justice. That was TNA this past week. Impact, we're going to talk on Friday, which means it's going to be your Saturday video. So the podcast will be up Saturday for everyone to enjoy that we're not able to join us live when we are filming at 11 p.m. on Friday night. Ashley and myself talking to TNA Impact. And Ashley hasn't watched TNA in a minute, so it's going to be entertaining to uh, recap everything. Kind of like what he did with me in WrestleMania, so yeah. He turned, he tuned out of TNA for a while, and this is his return. I tuned out of WWE for a while, and WrestleMania was my return. I know it's completely opposite, but it still works. So, uh, that being said, uh, tomorrow, brand new sip and snack. Finally going to get that root beer special. Got a lot of awesome stuff. Snacks coming up very soon. Uh, maybe some low on the sips for a bit. And Friday, AJ's movie reviews will tackle Hot Pursuit and a couple of limited releases. Saturday, we'll bring you your newest edition of the TNA Impact Podcast, the first one. And Sunday, brand new versus your Cryptic Comics, Crime Boss. Monday, instead, uh, we're going to go into um, NXT on uh, Wednesday, actually, for a change. So, yeah, you're going to get to watch the NXT video from myself the week. The day of the next NXT show. I know that makes no sense, but that's how it's going to work. Because Monday, brand new smorgasbord of information and gaming with Ash. Tuesday, will be Ashley and myself talking all things WWE Raw. They're live from Cincinnati, Ohio. We're going to talk about that. And a uh, brand new sip and snack on Thursday. Going to focus on... Um, haven't decided if it's going to be Goldfish or Fiber One. I haven't quite decided. That'll happen very soon, though. And um, AJ's movie reviews on Friday of... I remember what week it is. Mad Max and Pitch Perfect 2, uh, with possibly some other things. We'll see what happens. So that being said, in the meantime, if you like these videos, tell your friends about them, leave a comment, do subscribe, help spread the word about Pop. If you haven't yet, go to Facebook, click like on our Facebook fan page. It's under Sir Owen Disney Pop, or search Sir Owen Disney and Pop on Facebook if you want to search for it manually instead of typing it in the address bar. While you're there, go ahead and send me a friend request. Let me know that you're a... Uh, a fan of the channel, if you uh, like what you're seeing on here, all the content you're getting every single week, every single day here on Pop, regardless if it's wrestling, if it's theme parks, if it's Halloween Horror Nights, or if it is wrestling, let me know that you like this channel by uh, sending me a friend request. It's under Owen Disney. If you want to tweet me, it's at Sir Owen Disney. Last but certainly not least, I want to see your thoughts, comments, queries, and opinions. You want to talk WWE, TNA, you want to talk NXT with me, Halloween Horror Nights, Universal Disney. Since obviously Kong's going to be announced today, we'll talk about that very soon. Uh, very soon if you also have a wrestling or theme park podcast you're like you need to become a part of that let me know that way or if you have any questions that I can't answer on here you can let me know that way or if you want to become a podcast yourself send all your content all this and more sorrow and Disney at gmail.com so in the meantime I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching and until tomorrow boys and girls that's all I gotta say about that <laughs>